Hello everyone and welcome back. Now in the previous two videos, we used separation of variables to solve the one-dimensional heat equation using Dirichlet boundary conditions that led to sine series and Neumann boundary conditions, which led to cosine series. I'm gonna look at one other case for a one-dimensional rod here. In this video, we're gonna apply separation of variables to it, but I'm gonna use a different kind of boundary conditions, one that wasn't explored in my previous video on boundary conditions. That is because we're not going to look at a one-dimensional rod. We're going to look at a one-dimensional ring. Okay, so what happens here is that heat flows along the ring, but we have to account for this periodicity, right? If I go all the way around this thing, I come back. So if heat is maybe flowing like this, it's going to eventually sort of catch up with itself. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say... I'm going to say, uh, for mathematical convenience, I'm going to take my domain to be minus L to L. Now, I know you don't like me for that because I was using zero to L for a long time, but the, sym the symmetric boundaries here make things a little bit easier. It's sort of like how we denote a circle by minus pi to pi or zero to two pi. Either one works. Uh, here, I'm going to kind of use the minus pi to pi. But essentially what this says is that x equal to minus L and x equal to L have to be identified as the same point on my, uh, on my domain. And what this means is that if I take my sort of standard heat equation that I've been using over and over and over again, k u squared u over ux squared, uh, then my boundary conditions have to reflect this periodicity, right? Because there's no influence from the outside. There's no submersion in a, in a bath, right? There's no, no flux conditions, there's nothing. I just have to account for this periodicity, which means that I have to have u of minus lt is equal to u of lt. If I go all the way around, the temperature has to be continuous. But also, look at I have two space derivatives. That means I have to be, have a continuous function and its derivative has to be continuous as well. So I actually am going to impose these conditions on the derivative as well. So I get a smooth transition in the heat. And again, this is a, a physical thing that we would see, right? You're not going to see uh, potentially like a big spike at this boundary. That just wouldn't make sense. I mean, the, the location of the spike is, is relatively arbitrary. You would see a nice smooth transition at every single point on the ring. Okay, but now you can kind of repeat everything, right? So again, separation of variables, SOV, our sort of weapon of choice while we go through this. So we say u of xt is equal to phi of x g of t. Same thing that we've been doing over and over and over again, but here's the thing, okay? So again, you can use separation of variables. You get two ODEs. You can solve for G very, very easily. Again, we already did this with the Dirichlet. All that I care about right now is this guy because this is what describes my sort of spatial modes, right? Remember it was sines before, it was cosines uh, with Neumann conditions. Well, what do the periodic boundary conditions look like? They give me these two things. They tell me that phi of minus L is equal to phi of L. That's this condition right here, the jump condition. And then you have also the smoothness condition, which is in their derivatives. Okay, so it's, it's almost like a, a sort of combination of Dirichlet and Neumann, except that these values aren't fixed. They're only just fixed to be each other. Now, we've already seen that there are some cases here that we need to take advantage of. So there's lambda positive, lambda negative, and lambda equal to zero. I'm going to save you some work. I'll tell you that lambda negative doesn't work. Okay, but let's take a look at lambda positive. Okay, well in this case, we've done it you know, three times now. Cos of root lambda x plus C2 sine of root lambda x. 
But sine and cosine are already periodic functions, right? So all we need to do to satisfy these boundary conditions, well, it's going to require that uh, essentially we need lambda chosen so that these things are actually periodic on this domain, okay? So you can do this by plugging in these boundary conditions, but essentially what you need is to have the, the these conditions, minus L to L, all set up properly. And this is gonna give us just a condition on lambda. And it's gonna be that same thing we've seen over and over again. All right? So basically here, all you need is, is to get the periodicity down. Sine and cosine already give you the periodicity. You just need to make sure that the, the, uh, the period of this thing is matching up with the length of the interval. And that's just by choosing the right value of lambda here, okay? And then similarly, for lambda equal to zero, again, you can just find that 5x is constant, all right? And this is, this is the same basic thing uh, as the, the Neumann boundary conditions of the previous case, right, where we saw that there's a, this sort of n equal to zero cosine mode. But here's the thing. Essentially, the periodic boundary conditions give you both sines and cosines because you could use cos or you could use sine in here. So hence, my superposition gives me this like super series basically now. I'm going to use A0 for my cosine terms. So A0, sum, and then An cos n pi x over l e to the minus k n pi over l squared t. That's all the cosines. And then plus, and I'll use bn as the coefficients for sine, n pi x over l e to the minus k n pi over l squared t. Take a look at the behavior of this thing before we do anything with initial conditions. As t goes to infinity, this thing disappears, this thing disappears. All that you're left with is a zero. Now, if you use your intuition from the previous uh, lecture, you know that a zero should be the average of the initial temperature distribution, right? What I really want you to notice here is that the periodic boundary conditions put you in a sort of superposition of superpositions. You're in a superposition of the Neumann solution and the Dirichlet solution here, okay? So even though, uh, you know, the, we have this sort of physical relevance of a circular rod, a lot of the time we just use boundary conditions as avoiding boundary effects. And so what is it that I mean by that? Well, remember when we had Dirichlet conditions, we only had the sine series. So we didn't see any of the, the cosine part. Whereas whenever we had Neumann boundary conditions, we only saw the cosine part, but not the sine part. When we open ourselves up to periodic conditions, we get to see both of them. So sometimes people study periodic boundary conditions to avoid boundary effects. So for example, the Navier-Stokes partial differential equation, there's currently a $1 million prize if you can prove the existence and uniqueness of solutions to that. Very, very complicated problem. You know, we're not gonna get to it in this lecture series. The interesting thing is, you're allowed to prove that with periodic boundary conditions. Not with Neumann boundary conditions, not with Dirichlet boundary conditions, but you are allowed to prove it with periodic. And the reason for that is because the periodic boundary conditions sort of simulate no boundary conditions. Okay, so a very, very rough and dirty explanation here. Um, but nonetheless, I hope that you can kind of see where this is coming from. Okay, so what about the initial condition? Well, it's going to be, you know, some initial temperature distribution f of x. And if we set t equal to zero, we get a like a super sine and cosine series, right? So we call this a Fourier series. We're going to go deeper on it later. Uh, but we're going to have to have a summation that looks like this. Cos of uh, n pi x over l plus the sum 
of n greater than or equal to 1 sine at bn n pi x over l. Now we've already kind of seen how we could find a0 and an, right? We can just multiply by either the sine or the cosine mode. But now, you know, you're going to have cross terms. So if I multiply by sine of pi x over l, you need to make sure that this thing disappears or else you've got too many terms. So it turns out that you have orthogonality conditions. So orthogonality. And this orthogonality comes in three different forms, okay? So I'm going to start with the two you know. So here's the cosine one from the last lecture. Cos of m pi x over l dx. Now we saw that this will give you zero if the modes are different. It'll give you l over two if the modes are the same but not zero. And it'll give you l if the modes are zero. Okay, just to recap, same thing for sines. Now there's no zero mode for sines because sine of zero is zero. Sorry. So we're good on this. We have these nice orthogonality conditions for the sines and the cosines considered separately. Ah, I didn't really space this out very well, but that's okay. But the one that we care about is also the mutual orthogonality condition. So I take cos of any mode and I multiply it by sine of any mode. It turns out that this always disappears. So that means that I can still use the same basic ideas of finding my A0s, my ANs, and my BNs, right? Because all I have to do is, is multiply by the corresponding sine or cosine mode, and once I integrate over space, infinitely many terms disappear. So, A0 is just the average of the initial condition, just using the derivation that we had in the previous lecture. An is these projections onto each cosine mode. And Bn is the projection onto each sine mode. N pi x over L dx. Okay, and again, all of it really sort of comes from this mutual orthogonality condition. If this was not zero, we would never be able to do this. But these things right here, they are called the Fourier coefficients. Now we're going to go way deeper on Fourier theory and Fourier coefficients and Fourier series as we go further into this lecture series. We're still going to focus for the next couple lectures on solving the heat equation and in particular the Laplace equation. But for now, this is your first introduction potentially to Fourier theory, right? And essentially, you know, what I would like you to really pay attention to here is a sort of signal processing aspect of this. And that is that you can take functions and you can decompose them into just nice oscillations into waves, right? We talk about waves. Well, we, uh, waves are just oscillations back and forth. Sines and cosines are oscillations back and forth. This allows us to do the expansion. It tells us exactly what every term in the expansion is. I'm using equal here because I know the answer, but I haven't shown you that this is actually equal all the time. So we should be careful. I haven't talked about convergence of the series. Nothing fancy yet. But for the time being, just know that you can decompose this thing, right? And so, of course, you know, Fourier was doing this for the heat equation. Fourier is the person who's most closely associated to the, to the heat equation, the Fourier transform, Fourier series, the Fourier coefficients, Fourier's law. You know, these are all things that came from or derived from the heat equation. But, of course, the, the Fourier series, if you have heard of it before, um, this thing exists in like all kinds of areas of mathematics. 
particularly in signal processing, and it comes from this idea of decomposing things into orthogonal waves. Orthogonal meaning that you can, when you multiply them together and integrate them, they disappear. It's an infinite dimensional, it's a function version of perpendicularity of vectors in Rn. Okay, when we come back in the next lecture, we're going to actually do a two-dimensional domain example. So I'll see you all there.